Good to see everybody this morning. <laughs> Resurrection Sunday. I love what Pastor said on Friday night. This, this is like our, our day, you know, it's such a big day for us. Well, hey, what do you say we pray and we'll get started for the day. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Lord, thank you so much for what you did. We don't have to go to hell. We don't have to live in darkness. You gave your life for us and then you arose again ever living to intercede for us. Lord, we're so thankful. How could we ever repay you? Lord, thank you for giving us your word this morning. We love you so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll continue on with our series of lessons on Ezra and Nehemiah. This is a study of post-exilic Israel. Last week, we did not get to finish uh, lesson number seven. Hopefully, we get to circle back around and revisit that. But it was Nehemiah chapter three, which is Ezra detailing for us, really, this group of people worked on this part of the wall and they worked on this gate. And this group of people, this family worked on this part of the wall and this gate, whether it be the sheep gate, the fish gate, uh, whatever. And all that stuff, if we're not careful, that can just be words on a page that gets lost, right? So if you're like me, you like to have a visual. A visual is good. Like, it's not just words on a page, but it's a visual. And so I've been wanting to show that, uh, kind of like a map of, of Jerusalem, the city, with the, with the walls and the gates and that kind of thing. But this seems to fit perfectly uh, because it is Resurrection Sunday. And it's just cool for me to think the gates that Nehemiah repaired are actually the gates that we read about in the book of Matthew, in the book of Mark, in the book of Luke, and of John. So I'm hoping if we look at the city, uh, this will even make the Gospels come to life to us even more. Because you can hear about these gates and it not even mean anything to you. But if you can actually get a visual, I think this will mean so much more to us. I'm always reminded of Psalm chapter 24, which says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up. O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. It's pretty neat to think about. We're talking about the gates that the Lord Jesus actually walked in. You can go ahead and show that, Dylan, if you don't mind. Go ahead and pull up some of those pictures. But as we said, the gates that Jesus moved in and out of in Jerusalem were repaired by this Nehemiah, that we're actually discussing in this series nearly 500 years earlier. I like to think about it like this. I want us to see this because I was never a big Star Wars fan, but I know there's a lot of Star Wars people in here. Uh, And they tell me that Star Wars actually in the 1980s, they started with episode number four, right? And then it was number five and number six. And then 20 years later, they came back and they did episode one, two, and three. So now you go back and watch one, two, three, you can go back and watch number four, and it makes so much more sense to you, right? Now, I was never a Star Wars guy, okay? I was too busy watching March Madness and that kind of thing. But that's a pretty neat, uh, you know, that's a pretty neat way of doing things. So in the same way, you and I have heard the gospel accounts all of our lives, but if we don't maybe see uh, a history of the Bible, or if we don't know what was going on in the city before Jesus came to it, we may not know the whole full story. So if we can start seeing the full story, it may mean so much more to us. But this, from the proverbial 50,000 feet, right, this is Jerusalem. You see, you see the walls, uh, you see some of the gates. We're going to talk about the gates. Notice uh, the north side was a lot of the plains, and they, they maybe not, it didn't show it as much here, but to the, to the west and the south, is a, it's kind of a valley, and it, it's a lot different topography. But just keep this mental note as we go on to the next couple of screens. Go ahead and do that next one, Dylan, please. But this is uh, Jerusalem's walls and gates. I hope you guys can see this. And I wanted to show this because Pastor talked about this briefly last week with Palm Sunday and the, the, triumphant, entry, the triumphant entry. And he was talking about the sheep, the sheep gate was on the northeast side of Jerusalem. I was like, yes, I know this, Pastor. I've been studying this, right? So we'll go through this just briefly, just so you can kind of see what some of these gates are. You've got the sheep gate on the northeast side. This is where they brought in all the sheep from the plains, and they would bring them into the temp- the, to the inspection area, and the ones that were worthy would be offered in the temple, right? And what's really neat is that when Jesus was entering into the city during his time of public ministry, he would always come in through the sheep gate because he was willing to be inspected. 
Now, what we're going to see in a minute is when he came in for the triumphant entry and when he comes back into the city a second time, he's not coming in through the sheep gate to be inspected. He's coming back next time to do the inspecting, right? Pretty cool to think about. You've got the fish gate. This is where they would obviously bring in the fish so people within the city could have, have food. You've got the old gate, which is where a lot of the elders would meet. People... Uh, you know, they spiritualize this and they say this gate means this and you could teach countless lessons on this. For example, they may say the sheep gate is where you come in uh, to the kingdom and the fish gate is where you instantly become a fisher of men and you start telling people about the Lord Jesus. The old gate is where you go to the elders and the pastors to be discipled. I mean, you can get into all that. That's really not the purpose of what we're doing today. I'm just wanting us to see a map and kind of see the history of this city. The valley gate is interesting down here. We talked about it last week. When Nehemiah was circling the city uh, during the night season, the only gate that he could get his horse into was through the valley gate because the rest of the city was so just in rubble and was destroyed. Isn't that crazy to think about that? We may not have ever heard that, but the city was totally destroyed. But he's willing to come in through the valley gate where there was terrible terrain, but he was willing to do the difficult thing and come in through the valley gate. The dung gate... You know, probably don't need to explain what that is. That's where they take out all the trash and the, and the, and the rubbish from the city. If, if you remember that the, Jesus talked about the fires of Gehenna, or Gehenna they would, that's where they would burn all the trash and the rubbish. And Jesus said, hell will be just like the fires of Gehenna. There's always that methane just burning. It's constantly on fire. So Jesus, he compared hell to this valley just outside of the Dungate where there's just constantly fires burning. The fountain gate and the water gate are kind of synonymous. That's where they would bring the water into the city so people could have water. There was a, there was a, a fountain down there. I think it was called like the Gihon Spring or something like that. But that's where they would get their water. Now's where it starts to get interesting. You got the horse gate. This is where the king and his men would ride out with their horses and their chariots and they'd go out for battle and they would come back in from battle. Now the east gate, uh, as we said, when the Lord Jesus would come in during his public ministry, he would come in through the sheep gate. But when he came in uh, on Palm Sunday or for the triumphant entry, he actually came in through the east gate, which was actually a fulfillment of prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 44, which said when the Shekinah glory returns to the temple, it would come in through the east gate. Pretty neat to think about, huh? And if, if you were to see a, a, the full picture, the Mount of Olives is actually due east of the East Gate. So it's actually believed that when he comes back the second time, he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives and come back in through the East Gate. Dylan, if you would, go ahead and show what the East Gate looks like, just because I like to see this stuff. Isn't that pretty cool? This is where the Lord Jesus would have entered into the city uh, at his initial peering to Jerusalem. And it's pretty cool to think about when he comes back a second time. This is where he's going to come back also. So you can go ahead and flip back, uh, Dylan. Flip back to that other map. And then just one last point. And I hope, uh, I'm sure Pastor will talk about this today. I, I hope I don't. But he's been talking about sufferings and that kind of thing. So it, it really got me thinking. But there is a way called the way of sufferings. You may have heard it's called the Via Doloroso. You can actually... There's like a 14-point trip where if you were to go to Israel today, you could actually see where the Lord Jesus was tried and, uh, and prosecuted. And then they marched him out of the city to be offered up outside the city, what was called Golgotha or the place of the skull, or in Latin, it was called Calvary. But you would think it's actually due west of the old gate. You would think they would have marched him from the temple area out the old gate to Golgotha. But they do not, evidently because of the topography or the terrain or, or for whatever reason. What is extremely interesting is when they march him out of the city, they actually march him back up through the Sheep Gate. Then he goes west over the plains and then heads down to Golgotha, which is just pretty interesting to me because that says the Lamb of God came to them, the, the ultimate sheep came to them, but they rejected him the exact same way that he came back into the city. And then they sent him to, to Golgotha to be crucified. So you can see how there's just so much amazing stuff. You know, so much, what's the word? Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies and just kind of cool to think about. But I hope this helps you guys, you know. 
It, it, to me, it's just neat to see this. So now when you read about the sheep gate or the fish gate or the east gate in the Bible, now it just won't be something that you just pass over, but it can be something that actually comes alive to us, right? Just cool Bible stuff, cool history that we can see on Resurrection Sunday about the book of Nehemiah. So yeah, I don't want to, that was, I guess, extracurricular activity, right? Stuff outside of the, it truly was extracurricular activity, you know, outside of the, <laughs> the curriculum. But uh, we, when we were talking about Ezra, we, bro- we broke down the book of Ezra into three parts, kind of helped us digest the book of Ezra. And we're going to attempt to do that also with the book of Nehemiah. We talked about the book of Nehemiah is almost made for television drama, right? It's about this gentleman that just, withstood so much, endured so much opposition, and, find, and just finished the, the plan of God for his own life. But we're going to attempt to break down the book of Nehemiah into three parts also. And from those three parts, we want to pull out two major themes that we want to see from the book of Nehemiah. The first part is what uh, we talked about last week, is Nehemiah being sent back by Artaxerxes and rebuilding the, the wall, which was 2.4 miles long, rebuilding that in 52 days. So when most people think about Nehemiah, this is the Nehemiah we're thinking about. We know him as the wall builder, but there's so much more to Nehemiah than that. The second part of Nehemiah, chapter 8 and chapter 9, where we're going to see the Jews renew their covenant with God after Ezra the priest literally stands on a wooden platform and just recites the law of God to them. And we'll get into that more next week. And then the third part of Nehemiah is he actually at one point returns to Artaxerxes, goes back to the Persian king, but comes back to inspect Jerusalem and sees that it's fallen into disrepair once again, falling into syncretism, falling into compromise. And that's when he stands and operates as a governor and offers all kinds of reforms to the city uh, to get them back where they need to be. So there's three major parts that you can really see in the book of Nehemiah. The two main themes we want to see, one of them, the first one is what we just talked about. Oh, you can go back to the curriculum, Dylan, I'm sorry. Uh, The first main theme, or the first major theme in Nehemiah is that this is all preparation for the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the Old Testament uh, points to the Lord Jesus Christ, but this one really does because it's almost like it's starting to be on a fast track. The city is beginning to uh, be prepared for the coming of its Messiah. Pretty neat to think about. The second thing in Nehemiah is what we're going to talk about today. And Pastor has laid out this curriculum for us beautifully. It's really just one major theme broken down into a couple different you know, things that we'll get into. But the second thing in Nehemiah is the constant opposition that he did endure. This man just stood in the fire. He just stood in the storm and just continued to do what God uh, had put on his heart to do. We talked about last week that Nehemiah was a champion in the faith. He was a champion because he overcame opposition. Nehemiah was not a champion because he did not ever endure anything. Nehemiah was a champion because everything in the world came against him, but yet he just continued to move forward and press on and do what God had told him to do. So as we said, we're going to get into Lesson 8 today. Um, In Lesson 8, there were seven stages of opposition that came against the Jews in Nehemiah, and we'll talk about that today. So yeah, just the main theme of today, we're going to talk about what was the main source of opposition for Nehemiah, and we're going to talk about how that opposition continued to escalate uh, the more that Nehemiah just would not give in. Uh, Lesson number eight, Nehemiah's primary opposition. The opposition, Nehemiah faced more opposition than his two predecessors combined. He not only faced the typical opposition from without, which was Samaritans, and from within, which was naysayers and sluggards, but he also had to fight syncretism all over again with the priesthood. Once again, we'll look at that more in lesson number nine, which will be uh, next week, and that will conclude this entire series, but uh, he, and faced, uh, he faced opposition from everyone. The Samaritans is what we're going to look at today. He fought all this opposition from without, um, and then he also had opposition from within. We talked about last week how uh, in Nehemiah chapter 4, there was all of this rubble, 
all of this destruction around them. And you know how it is when you've just got destruction and all this, these obstacles working against you. When you start to get tired and you start to get fatigued, you instantly just begin to complain, right? So no doubt they were complaining against Nehemiah, but he just, he wouldn't give up. He didn't quit. He just continued to do what God told him to do. The critical pattern to be learned from the attacks against the post-exilic revival is this. If the devil cannot make you quit serving God through discouragement, he will look to pervert your service to God through syncretism. That's good, isn't it? I love how Pastor lays this out for us. But if syncretism is resisted, he will resort back to discouraging you. He will repeat this process until you fight back and gain the victory over him or until you have a total spiritual meltdown and he wins. So half the battle in this thing is just continuing to do what God tells you to do. When opposition comes against us, we don't need to be surprised. Wouldn't it be great to just live in a world where you didn't ever have to fight anything? You know, be great to live in a world where you, <laughs> sometimes it feels like with life, you're just uh, getting under that squat bar. You know, when you go to the, the, the weight room and it's, you're on that squat rack and it's heavy and you're pushing up heavy weight and sometimes life feels like that. Wouldn't it be nice just to be able to not push up any weight sometimes? But that's just not the world that we live in, especially if you and I want to do anything for God. That's just, it's just the price of admission. To do anything for God, there is going to be, there's going to be opposition. It's going to be difficult from time to time, but that doesn't mean that we quit. Uh, oh, yeah, okay, so he will repeat this process until you fight back and gain the victory over him or until you have a total spiritual meltdown and he wins. Excuse me. So the pattern is going to be discouragement, syncretism, then it'll be discouragement, then it'll be syncretism, then there may be some discouragement again. <laughs> so, and this is actually a lengthy curriculum, so to be honest, I'm just going to go through this. Pastor, like I said, he lays this out beautifully. Such a theme of Nehemiah is just opposition. Things coming against this man of God. He just doesn't quit. Satan will never quit this pattern. Will you quit your fight against it? The hellish trinity. Nehemiah's favor with King Artaxerxes and his desire to help Israel instantly caused problems for him in Judah. Three regional leaders, also under Artaxerxes' rule, rose up in, uh, against Nehemiah out of envy and hate. This hellish trinity of opposition was comprised of three leaders. So we're going to get into detail of who these leaders were. But think about this. Really, in the Persian kingdom, they had, they had expanded their kingdom. And Judah, or Jerusalem is really one of these provinces just on the outside. So all of it was under Artaxerxes' rule. But you also got to remember there was some wild, wild west politics happening, right? I mean, we've got wild, wild west politics happening in the United States. <laughs> and we're a nation. I mean, imagine how on the outskirts of this, of this, uh, of this empire, you know, it, you've got stuff going on. So you've got these gentlemen who were, who were ruling Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Geshem, and now the Lord sends back a governor to rebuild Jerusalem. They didn't like that. Well, in the same way, if you and I are looking to build the kingdom of God, there's going to be forces at work against us in this earth also. So we can look at the spiritual context be behind all of this as well as the natural. But the three, uh, the three opposers of Nehemiah, the first one was Sanballat. He was the governor of Samaria. Samaria, Samaria is to the north of Ju Samaria. <laughs> Samaria is to the north of Judah. Um, I wish we could take more time to deal with, again, the idea of who the Samaritans were. Pastor did lay this out wonderfully in this series of lessons. I think it was lesson two and lesson three. I didn't, we didn't get to cover it as much as I would like, but it is there. Um, Samaria, the Samaritans were, of course, the Israelites who married with the Assyrian people that were moved into Israel after the Israelites were moved out by the Assyrians. So you, you may remember that. We talked about that briefly. It's interesting. Sanballat was actually, it's believed he was raised at the foot of Mount Gerizim. There's a lot to this. There's a lot of spiritual context that we just won't be able to get into today because of time. But Mount Gerizim is the mountain where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in John chapter four, and she says, 
you Jews wor- say we're supposed to worship at that mountain. Our fathers have worshiped at this mountain. The mountain she's talking about is Mount Gerizim, which is the mountain that the Samaritans set up as their place of, of temple worship. And there's so much more to that. We just don't have time to, to get into the, that today. Just throwing that out there. Just really, just so we know, there's a lot of spiritual context going on behind the scenes, right? Relating to the Samaritans and the Jews and all of that. So he's really the primary source of opposition. There's also Tobiah, who's an Ammonite leader. He's a governor in Ammon. Ammon is to the east of Judah. And there's Geshem, who is an Arab chief. Geshem was an Arab controlling several Arabian tribes of Moab and Edom. Moab and Edom are to the east and to the south of Judah. Nehemiah and the people of Israel were literally surrounded by opposition on every side. Every revival of God will experience opposition from every side. There will always be those that hate to see God's work flourishing, right? So once again, we got to expect this. If we're going to do anything in this earth, if we're going to live godly and righteous, even the Bible says we need to experience persecution or we need to expect persecution we might as well just go ahead and get ready for it now when everything is going well that's great right (laughs) but typically it's going to require a lot of faith a lot of uh, a lot of exercising our faith on our part Nehemiah chapter 2, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant and the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was a man, or there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. There was waves of opposition. The hellish trinity of Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem demonstrated an escalating attack on Nehemiah. And that's what we're going to see in this series of lessons. It seemed like there was just waves of opposition, and it truly was an escalating attack. Like I said, there was seven stages we're going to see. It started with just words, and then there became even heavier threats. And oh, wait till we get to number seven. Oh, that one actually is the one. That one, that one gets me the most. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. Um, we can just see where the enemy really starts to work in their personal relationships, and this really gets muddy. And the devil works like this instead of sometimes, instead of sometimes just coming at us with a, a full frontal assault. He starts to work through relationships and he starts to use trickery dealing with people in our lives. Wait till you see number seven. (laughs) No, I don't want to say it makes my fist curl up, but maybe a little bit. No, you know, it's just it's just the way the enemy works. They brought wave after wave of demonic opposition to Nehemiah in the work. It should also be noted that everything Nehemiah and the Jews accomplished for the Lord eventually made its way to the ears of the surrounding community. All right, so yeah, seven stages. The first stage Nehemiah went, or that came against Nehemiah, was just simply mocking ridicule. Just almost laughing at God's people for them wanting to do something. And a lot of times this is all the enemy has, right? All he can do is look at truth can't really say anything about it, can't do anything about it, but he can mock it. He can laugh at it. He can belittle it. That's oftentimes the only thing he's got to to work with. And of course, it's where Sanballat and this tribe of no good doers starts. Mocking ridicule. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed and mocked us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Well, they weren't even rebelling against the king. He was sent by the king. But they're just mocking, just distorting the truth. In the beginning, there were only three individuals opposing Nehemiah and his revival, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. But this number was about to grow. Demonic opposition always seems to begin small and with childish mocking and laughter. Oh, but this is powerful, this next statement. But this mocking and this laughter is a powerful and an effective strat- strategy against many Christians who desires the, desire the world's approval. That's true right there. If we're people that only just want to please everybody around us more than we want to p- please the Lord Jesus, their, their, modic- their, their, their ridicule and their mocking is going, to, is going to bring us to a halt, Right? This is why we can't seek the world's approval. But what was Nehemiah's response? Once again, we talked about this last week. Anytime opposition came against Nehemiah, we can learn from him 
Because anytime opposition came, the first thing he, do, he did was he looked up and he offered prayer to God. And then he, he looked at that situation, he looked at that opposition, and he spoke against the opposition. That's always the plan for us. Anytime something comes against us, we instantly pray to God, and then we speak to that situation so that we can see it begin to change. That's good, and that's old. That's old word of faith doctrine that you and I can hold on to. <laughs> when something comes, we just we, we, we go to our God, and then we talk to that situation, and we use the word of God against it. So obviously, Nehemiah offers a response. Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. Nehemiah said, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to arise and build. But you, as for you, you mocker, you one who ridicules, you have no portion, nor right, nor claim, nor memorial or historic right in Jerusalem. It's powerful, isn't it? That's good stuff. Nehemiah responded to ridicule by reaffirming that he answered to God, not man, and God would prosper his servants. And sometimes life will come and knock us off our frame a little bit, right? But we just get right with God, and we reaffirm when that happens that we answer to God. He also firmly reminded the opposition that it was none of their business what went on in Jerusalem, for they were pagan, inside, at pagan outsiders. <laughs> this, is a, this is an A-B conversation. You can see your way out of this one, right? <laughs> so the first step is mocking ridicule. Just words, you know, which will stop some people, but not for those. It won't stop those who really want to build something for God. Then there's angry ridicule. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and he took great indignation and he mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and, and before the army of Samaria. And he said, what do these feeble Jews uh, you know, basically, what are these feeble Jews doing? This is where he mocks him and says, they're rebuilding this wall, but even if a fox went on this wall, it would break the wall down. You know, it'd tear the wall down. He's just, he's just mocking what God wants to do. And you and I can't listen to that stuff. Uh, what are these feeble Jews doing? And Tobiah the Ammonite was with him. So the opposition has grown. Sanballat has included his brethren and the army. Opposition is always angered by its own failure. Therefore, we should not be surprised when our opposition returns angry and in greater numbers. If we don't give in to the enemy, once again, the opposition is going to escalate and it may turn into anger. But okay, <laughs> you know, we're on God's side. You know, he's the one that fights for us, so we can expect this. Uh, in the second wave of opposition here, the attack has been intensified. We no longer have laughing ridicule. It has become angry ridicule, which usually manifests as insults, <laughs> along with name calling and troop gathering. So, name calling, that's funny. Yeah, it may happen from time to time. What was, but once again, we see Nehemiah has response. If we don't hear anything else from this lesson, let's hear that Nehemiah always had a response always talked back to it did not let him did not let this push him off of his frame he just continued to do what God told him to do here's Nehemiah's prayer hear O God for we are despised turn their reproach un upon their own head so we so built we the wall and the wall was joined together under the half thereof for the people had a mind to work they stayed encouraged, even though things were working against them to bring discouragement. The Bible says here um, that they had a mind to work, which really means that they stayed encouraged. We talked about last week how they had, every day they had to return to the wall and see all this rubble. Because when Babylon burned the city of Jerusalem, they didn't say, hey, let us go ahead and carry out all this rubble for you guys so you can rebuild eventually, right? No, they just left it all as it was. And so the Jews had to look at this every day as they were rebuilding all the work that was in front of them. And oh yeah, while they're rebuilding the city, now they're getting threats from people that are starting to mock them and ridicule them and eventually even bring death threats, right? We'll see how this, uh, uh, this opposition begins to escalate. But when the attack increases, so must prayer. We have to pray about this stuff. We have to. Nehemiah's response to the new wave of attack was to pray and to keep on working, to do both of them. He only slowed down long enough to pray. His leadership must have been contagious for his helpers had a mind to work and not a mind to dwell on the venomous words of the enemy. Oh, that's good. That's an art form right there is learning how to not dwell 
on negativity, not dwell on what the world is saying. Once again, I've said this so many times, I'm sorry if I just keep repeating it, but this is why I did this series of lessons, right? Even just to get my mind right, to remind myself that we are spiritually minded, we are heavenly minded. We can take our eyes off of what's going on down here and look at the Lord Jesus and be spiritually minded. And now once we have our perspective right, now we can come back and deal with all the situations that are working against us. We have to be there. We have to be there. We're not so spiritually minded that we don't deal with what's going on in the world. But my goodness, we have to have our perspective right to, have a, uh, to be able to attack this the right way. So we see mocking ridicule, angry ridicule. Now it begins to escalate. Now there are threats, conspiracies, and plans. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder or fashion perversion and to make error of it. So now they're not just throwing words out there, but they're actually making plans to come and to fight against the Jews. Now even more, opposition has been mustered. The original three opponents involved their people, uh, the Arabians, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites. These are Western, uh, Western enemies. Jerusalem is now surrounded on every side by its enemies. You know, sometimes we get surrounded. It seems like we're surrounded on every side. And we do begin to wonder, what are we going to do? This is a great, this would be a great passage for us to remember when it seems like we are surrounded by our enemies. Nehemiah was, but ultimately it was just a bunch of talk. We'll, We'll see that. They banded together against a common enemy to fight against it, hinder it, and pervert it. But once again, Nehemiah has a response. But we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Nehemiah's response was to increase prayer, adjust the workload by pulling some workers and making them watchmen to counter the threat. And they keep on working. He was not going to allow Israel to quit like they had done in the days of Zerubbabel. This is so powerful because now they're not just working, but they're actually uh, eternally vigilant in case the enemy comes, they're ready and prepared. to to fight if they have to. And I like this. We talked about last week, this is just my conjecture, just my thoughts, but my personal conjecture is that uh, the work that Nehemiah did was probably supposed to be done by Zerubbabel. And we won't go back and revisit the life of Zerubbabel. He's the one that rebuilt the temple, uh, the second temple, thank God, but he probably should have been the one that also restored the city and the walls. But God raised up Nehemiah to take care of it. But in the days of Zerubbabel, they got discouraged and they had a season where they quit. But not so with Nehemiah. He just did not quit. And we're going to see where uh, they counter these threats and these conspiracies and plans. And one of the more uh, infamous or one of the most well known quotes of Nehemiah is that at one point, it said that they, they, they were working with a sword in one hand and they had a brick in the other. So while they were building something for God, they were eternally vigilant and they were ready to fight against the enemy if they had to. Isn't that good? I mean, that's powerful, you know? And we need to live the same way. Always building for God, but always eternally vigilant. Always watching for our homes. Always, just, always looking to see if there's an attack from the enemy trying to weasel his way in where there's a breach in our wall. So threats, conspiracies, and plans. Once again, now we're going to see the fourth escalation. There were death threats. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or before they see us, we'll be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who live near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So they get discouraged. The enemy marches on them and they instantly start to to panic a little bit, right? They're saying right here, wherever we turn, uh, they're gonna attack us. They kept telling this story 10 times over. Isn't that how fear works if you're not careful? Oh no, the enemy said he's gonna do that to us. And then we just start speaking that over and over and over again. But Nehemiah has a response, right? By this point, Nehemiah's enemies are so numerous, he does not even bother to distinguish them by name. Their constant talk is murder and rampage. Remember that in order to stop the progress on the city, this same tactic of rampage and attack 
was used against Jerusalem 17 years prior. The attack has escalated to include murder. But I like this. This, is, this next one is Nehemiah's uh, ultimate, we'll call it, forgive me, the rah-rah speech, you know what I mean? Like I said, it's March Madness season. I love a good motivational speech from a coach, right? <laughs> we'll see here, Nehemiah has his motivational speech. Therefore, I said in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be ye not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren and your sons and your daughters and your wives and for your houses. This is us, right? We're willing to fight for what God has given to us fight for our families, fight for our church family, fight for our church, fight for the kingdom. We have to have that mentality. It should be apparent that nothing was going to stop the construction of this wall. Nehemiah pulled more workers off the wall and made them guards, arming them with swords, spears, and bows. Then in the midst of a building project, he delivered a speech worthy of war. His other countermeasures included uh, half of Nehemiah's men were workers and the other half were armed security. All the wall workers were armed. Once again, they're eternally vigilant. An alarm system comprised of trumpeters was installed. I like this one. He, they literally had trumpeters. So if there was trouble that came, they were ready to blow the trumpet and they were all ready to assemble and fight if they needed to. All of the workers and servants were moved into Jerusalem for the remainder of the project to provide uh, better nighttime security. Uh, what we're also seeing is even after this is rebuilt, Nehemiah, uh, he, he, prepare, he tells people, hey, don't even open up the city until the, uh, until the sun is up a certain height. You know, he's just, he's eternally vigilant. Everyone was armed at all times, even on water errands. So if it just seems like I'm just reading the curriculum today, that's because really what I'm doing is just reading the curriculum today. <laughs> I mean, this is good stuff, you know. Pastor lays this one out perfect for us. Like I said, I really wanted to share what we shared at the beginning of this session on, uh, you know, the walls of Jerusalem. But this is a five-page curriculum, and this is a masterpiece. So I, re I recognize we're just reading through this, but uh, it's just because there's just so much here, and it's laid out so perfectly for us. So there's the fourth, uh, the fourth phase of opposition. Now we'll get into the fifth one. Once again, the seventh one is the one that gets me, right? But we're starting to get into some not just full frontal assault and attacks verbal. We're starting to get into some actual uh, messy attacks. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, Sanballat and Geshem said unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some uh, one of the villages in the plain of Odo. But they thought to do me mischief, scheduling or scheming to harm me. It appears that an assassination attempt was being planned in order to demoralize the people of God. Isn't this messed up? The first four um, way, you know, schemes of opposition were just words against him. Now, once they see that they're having success, they say to Nehemiah, hey, come off the wall and meet with us over here in the plain of Ono. We just want to talk to you for a second. You, you dirty rat, right? <laughs> You just, oh man, wait till, but wait till number seven. This gets even better. Like I said, it appears that an assassination attempt was being planned in order to demoralize the people of God. But once again, Nehemiah has a response. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Basically, Nehemiah is saying, why would I even waste my time? You tried all this other stuff, you didn't stop us. Oh, you think I'm gonna come down from the wall now? Absolutely not. This has become Nehemiah's most famous response. He says, I'm too busy doing a great work for God. Go away. Every Christian should learn to tell their enemies to go away and just keep on working for God. Nehemiah, Nehemiah's enemies invited him five times to the peace accord and five times he rejected them. The fifth invitation came with a letter from Sanballat. Sanballat. Oh, actually, I said I hated number seven. I think number six is, I, I hate this one too, right? <laughs> number six is false accusations. What a bunch of, what a bunch of, this is where it gets messy and this is just how the enemy operates, right? 
It's reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true. The you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem, that there is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. This is all just a bunch of baloney, right? Because we know Artaxerxes actually sent Nehemiah back. Nehemiah is cupbearer to the king. He's close to him. He's not trying to revolt against the king. He's just rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, but there's these false accusations saying, no, you're just trying to rise up and overthrow the king. Baloney, fried baloney sandwich, right? Another tactic the devil will seek to use is distraction through false accusation. Christians should never leave the work of God to chase false accusations. If we're not careful, we'll do this because we want to preserve our reputation, right? So we may think it worthy to, to be concerned about what this person said and chase what this person said. And sometimes you need to do that. And sometimes you just got to recognize it's just going to happen anyway, right? Uh, Nehemiah's response, I sent him this reply, nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're just making this up out of your head. <laughs> they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. That's a good prayer right there, right? Lord, now strengthen my hands. You see the work that needs to be done. You see all, everything that we gotta go and deal with in the natural, all of the rubble, all of the destruction. We're gonna make this right for you. And ultimately, we're gonna see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, or, or the first appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he'll return as the, as the Messiah the second time. Uh, you see all this that needs to be done. Now strengthen my hands. I laugh a lot right now because we're at the age, my wife and I, where we're just, like everybody was like, did you watch the March Madness games this weekend? And I don't think I watched but 10 minutes because we're just watching Paw Patrol all the time at this point, right? Literally, it's all Paw Patrol. And one of the themes of Paw Patrol is that when you need the Paw Patrol to come and give you assistance, you just yelp for help, right? <laughs> yelp for help, okay? Same thing, when we need help from God, just yelp for help. Just pray unto God, right? Ask for his help. And the help will be, that'll preach, right? <laughs> just yelp for help, right? False accusations come just to frighten us. They are a demonic tactic designed to distract us from the real work at hand, weaken our hands and provoke us into wasting time doing unnecessary damage control. Nehemiah saw through this, called it out, simply prayed for strength. That's where we get our help. And finally, so once again, I hope you guys are seeing this. The whole purpose of this lesson is to see the escalating opposition that came against God's people as they were doing what God told them to do. Now, this is the one right here, and we'll close with this. I got like two, two or three minutes left. But what about this? When the enemy uses false friends and false prophets to come against us. Uh, after I came, afterward, I came into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehet. Mehetabil, who was shut up or shun in. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple. Let me, let, let me give us a little backdrop. This is, Shemaiah is, the, is a prophet of God who, according to how prophets operated in, in this day, he is shut in because that's what prophets did when they had the oracle of the Lord. They would hide themselves and then they would give the word of the Lord to the king when they had that word. So that's what's going on. Shemaiah is acting like he's the prophet of the Lord that has the word of the Lord for Nehemiah in this situation. This is, can you see how, w wait a minute, what, what are you doing, sir? Like this isn't a good idea to, to play this game, right? Um, he says, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. And lo, I perceive that God had not sent him. So Nehemiah had the uh, insight to know this is not God. But, he that, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. So this was a prophet for hire that was willing to use this position to actually work against the ultimate plan of God. Isn't that bad? Now can you see why I didn't like number seven? Hey, I, I, I told us in advance I didn't like this one. Now I'm sure you don't like this as much as I didn't like this one. Um, Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and go and sin that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. The attack was twofold that people could see, hey, wait, 
Uh, Nehemiah was using the temple for what it's not supposed to be used for. And number two, that it might appear that Nehemiah was afraid of the enemy and it may cause the people to be afraid. And so you can see where this prophet was hired to actually do damage to God's people. I told y'all number seven was terrible, right? The desperate Sanballat had to resort to hiring a Jewish shut-in with close ties to Nehemiah to instill fear in him and to set him up. Even Nehemiah had a Judas. But what was Nehemiah's response? My God, think thou upon Tobiah and, Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. Wow, that's good. The, the, the purpose of, of these prophets being hired was literally to put fear into Nehemiah and his people. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. Once again, Nehemiah simply prayed for God to, to remember them according to their works and finish the wall. Nehemiah 6.16, this is our conclusion. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and they lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Nehemiah's persistence and unflagging leadership accomplished a work that had begun nearly 100 years earlier. May God help us to complete every assignment that he gives us. And I hope you all enjoyed the first part where we actually got to see the city of Jerusalem. We got to see the walls. Thank God Nehemiah rebuilt that city because now we see the coming of the Messiah into this city uh, to ultimately give his life for you and for me. Just beautiful, beautiful story, right? Hey, let's pray and then we'll get ready for service. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. We say we're gonna worship you this morning. Thank you so, so much for what you did for us. Thank you that heaven touched earth, that you came to, to earth to, for a public ministry and to ultimately give your life for you and I so that we can be born again, saved, be, live in the light and have the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful. We love you so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. We love y'all. Church will start in 13 minutes.